Hello, welcome to Impact Waves, Short Waves, Lasting Impact Podcast Series. My name is Karen Talamelli, and my guest today is Erdin Aruk. Erdin is an adventurer and explorer. He's the first to complete a solo circumnavigation of the world by human power, the first to row three oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian, holds 15 Guinness World Records, and that is definitely the short list of all Erdin's accomplishments. Um, but when we last spoke, Erdin had recently rowed across the Pacific Ocean from California to the shores of the Philippines. And I am so thrilled to welcome Erdin back as he embarks on a new adventure. So great to have you back, Erdin. Glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, definitely. The pleasure is mine and ours on the Impact Wave team. But um, let's start by telling us about your upcoming adventure. Well, as you uh, alluded to it, I rode from Crescent City in California to the Philippines and landed at Legazpi in March of 2022. I stopped at Hawaii and then at Guam and reached uh, Philippines. My goal in that row, uh, physical goal, was to reach the foothills of Everest. And to serve that purpose, I am still going to reach mainland Asia. So I am returning to the Philippines to unite with my rowboat at Legaspi at the southeast corner of Luzon Island. I will prepare my boat in January and bicycle up to the very northwest corner of Luzon Island to Kurimao. And from Kurimao, I will launch with my rowboat, hoping to reach Da Nang in Vietnam. So I will row across the South China Sea in the month of February. Before, the, before February is out, I should reach Vietnam, shores of Vietnam. And then I will deal with the logistics of my rowboat, put it in a 40-foot container, lock it up, and while it waits there to be shipped forward to Portugal, I will start bicycling from there in the second half of March sometime toward Portugal, and the journey will carry on from there to South America. Oh, wow. Uh <laughs> so it'll be another circumnavigation. I've completed the first circumnavigation between 2007 and 2012. My overarching goal was to complete what I called Six Summits Project in memory of Joran Krop. He was an adventurer, a Swedish adventurer who had bicycled from Sweden to Nepal in 1996. And he died, fell during a rock climbing uh, a rock climbing trip that we were organizing together. We were on together. I was his belayer at the bottom of this rock pitch and he fell and I lost him in on February, I mean, September 30th of 2002. And that was actually the starting point for this whole thing, uh, catalyst to get me moving. And uh, in his memory, I decided that I was going to reach the highest summit on six different continents. And the first to climb was Mount McKinley in Alaska. I climbed that in 2003, summited it after bicycling to Alaska from Seattle, towing my climbing gear behind my bicycle like Yaron had to Everest. Oh, and then I launched on my circumnavigation in July of 2007. Along the way, I climbed Kosciuszko and Kilimanjaro. I had to skip Everest, Elbrus, and Aconcagua due to budget shortfall. And uh, so now it looks like Everest is going to have to be skipped yet again. Again, budget shortfall. And then Elbrus is very risky. I should not get into Russia. Uh, Elbrus is in the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, inside Russia on the border with Georgia. So one would have to get into Russia from Azerbaijan, go to the mountain climate and come back out. And we don't know with Griner and all uh, this hostage swapping kind yeah. of business that's been going on. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be safe to get in. Um, 
I may change my mind when I get there, but at this point it's looking unlikely. So that leaves Aconcagua yeah. on the list. Now that I take took my rowboat all the way to Philippines, I'm thinking I should just press forward, head west, and go to South America from Portugal, row to Georgetown in British Guyana, work my way south to Aconcagua, work that into the uh, accomplishments, uh, get one more summit out of the way in the Six Summits Project, but it is an awfully long approach to get to this one mountain at this time. So maybe it's smarter. This, if, if I were smarter, I would just ship my rowboat from Philippines back to Seattle and then regroup. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's not how I operate. Yeah, that's not the adventure sphere. I know, I, I did see that uh, on your list, Akagwa, um, on your six summits and following yeah. your list uh, to check off. And, and you're right. I think in Russia, there may be um, more challenging than the mountain, <laughs> the yeah. everything Bureau going on Bureau around. Bureaucracy and you never know. Uh, wartime, people change yeah. and you never know. Yeah. It, it could be, it could spell trouble. So. You know, that kind of got me into the last, you know, my next question I was going to ask you, because that's all on the planning. And obviously, there's all kinds of things that you do. There's uh, that um, other political climates going on, because we, oh, yeah. um, we discussed that we learned from your last visit that a great deal of planning goes into these adventures. The success of the trip is dependent on that when you're on the seas and bicycle paths and whatever. Could you tell us a little bit about what went into um, this particular trip? Well, I have to plan this one upcoming phase in multiple phases. So mm -hmm. uh, I am going to bicycle from Legazpi, where I landed, to Kurima, where I will launch. So I will bicycle inside uh, across Luzon Island in the Philippines. So I had to plan for that, get the parts together, talk to folks, uh, arrange a bicycle, so forth. So that's one part. Then I will row from Quy Mau across to Vietnam. Well, I have to get a visa to Vietnam. I have to arrange the logistics in advance. Uh, customs wanted to have a lot of uh, 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 questions answered. Uh, immigration, same way. I had to get the visa to Vietnam. Uh, and started this conversation and I have to receive my bicycle and accompanying equipment, panniers and such that will support me on the way to Portugal. So uh, we had to figure out how this was going to be done. Uh, I was told that Vietnam will not receive anything by DHL or UPS or FedEx. I have to use air cargo and I have to use China Airlines or Nippon Airlines or EVA, I think it was. Uh, uh, it's a Taiwanese outfit. I think it's EVA. Um, anyway, these three had to be used and it had to go to a specific airport so it could be pulled through customs. So you got the that being it's massaged and still trying to find an air freight forwarder agent to handle all of this for us because an airway bill has to be generated. So it's a different, more complicated Wow. Approach. So once that's done, then I will have all of these packed. My bicycle is being refurbished and I'm upgrading a few things. Uh, I had trailer before I'm leaving the trailer behind and I'm adding a frame bag. It's a triangular piece of bag that goes inside the frame and I'm adding additional bag on the handlebar. So with that, I will be able to carry a whole lot. I uh, upgraded my recording system, my video camera. I, I'm going to get a, uh, a the latest GoPro and also a 360 camera, Insta360. So with that, I will be able to capture a whole lot of things that will be stable. It won't shake as I move. Mm -hmm. And also, it will keep the horizon level. In the past, when I whenever I mounted a camera on my rowboat, well, the rowboat stayed stable inside the frame and the horizon moved, I moved, everything was moving except the boat. So this one uh, stabilizes the image. So it, there's no jittering going on and also the horizon stays level. So it's more the way it should be. So horizon stays level and you get the real motion and without getting that seasick oh. <laughs> feeling, just watching it. Yeah. Uh, 
And so I now have to master all of these various modes. I have to think about, should I get a VPN for my phone and uh, electronic SIM so that I can go across these countries one after another uh, and still have data access? All these things have to be sorted out. Uh, again, of course, visas are a huge issue. Uh, so I have to look into each country along the way and see what works where. And at this time, I am still waiting for approval from Myanmar authorities. Their embassy in Washington responded constructively asking for more information. And they said, we will pass this on to authorities in Myanmar to get approval uh, that I can actually enter over land border into Myanmar and then bicycle across north to the Indian border. But given the pandemic, land borders are closed and people want one, want, they want one to arrive by airline because they can control that better um, before one gets on the airplane, before boarding, you can arrive with a PCR test, antibody test, whatever they require, present that, get on the flight, get to the other side, be tested again before release, being released into the population. So they have that streamlined, but at the land borders, they may not have testing facilities readily or whatever the mm -hmm. restriction that they have in mind uh, is the reason for why they're not allowing land access. Uh, so borders remain closed and I need special approval to do that, to get into these countries. So getting into Myanmar, is one question mark. Uh, getting into India is another question mark. So when all of that fails, now I'm scheming in my head that, okay, I will go to the border by bicycle and leave my bicycle on this side and tell them <laughs> I'm not leaving the country. I'm just going to go uh, bump fist with the guard on the other side, <laughs> come back and then get on a bus, go to the airport, fly into the next country, and get approved, get in the approved, get into the country using the approved methods, and then get on another bus or vehicle, go to the border, do the reverse fist bump, <laughs> <laughs> and continue where I left off in the next country. So those are those kinds of uh, gymnastics may have to be done. It just adds to the difficulty, complexity, and adds costs. But, uh, one has to deal with people. It seems like the embassies aren't where you used to working with an adventurer. Um, I try to explain myself as best I can, but they are everybody's set up for regular tourists. Yeah. Right? So I am a special case. And often they just say, well, no exceptions. Uh, so that's been China's attitude oh. with their consulate in San Francisco. They kept saying no exceptions because I was explaining to them last year when uh, I was trying to get their visa to get into China. I was going to go nonstop and I was telling them, hey, I am going to arrive at Chinese shores after being at sea for months. Uh, I was going to go nonstop initially and I stopped at Hawaii just so I could try yet again uh, in their Los Angeles consulate, they said you have to go back to San Francisco because of being in the state of Washington details. And um, and I, I kept telling them, look, I am going to arrive at Chinese shores after being alone at sea for maybe six months, seven months. And I am not the threat. If anything, I will be under vaccinated and humanity will be the threat to me. So, and I will drop anchor under yellow flag procedures uh, as an international arrival. I can drop anchor and stay at anchor and stay as long as you want in the quarantining, quarantine on my rowboat. And then once I meet all the requirements, I can get ashore. And in the meantime, you cannot actually give me a booster shot and everything. So no, they weren't going to do that. And they kept saying no exceptions. Well, these yellow flag procedures for maritime or the maritime international maritime arrivals has been in place since the days of yellow fever. So this is a 19th century procedure that has been going on and being implemented. So wow. they were just unwilling to do that. Everybody went silly when this COVID thing hit. It's as if we were uh, reinventing the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Come wow. on, there are procedures in place. Use them. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't oh. convince them. They didn't oh. know. They were not mariners. 
uh, the, you know, embassy or consulate people dealing with visa applications. There was just anybody, a secretarial role, just saying no, no exceptions, mm -hmm. and they would just dismiss it. I yeah. even tried their uh, embassy in Beijing to contact the uh, Chinese government, and it just kept circling back to San Francisco office and no exceptions answer was the answer. So, oh, um, so a pandemic can be a, it has been a huge roadblock. So Myanmar right now is uh, under a new administration, shall we say, and they have internal strife, internal conflict going on, opposition versus the government. And if you go to their website, there's a, link to a page that lists all the restricted areas of uh, you can't go areas that require a permit areas that are allowed during the day only and not at night <laughs> just uh, these kinds of lists and then i had to google all of these on the uh, look at map and sort it out and then try to find a road that would meander uh, oh my gosh uh, thread between these areas and i think uh, I have such a ro route and I just wrote to them and I said, I'm willing to comply with whatever guidance you're going to provide. I will accept an escort if you require it, but please don't make me get in a car because this is a human powered journey. Yeah. <laughs> so just trying to explain myself and I don't know if it's going to uh, work. One good thing I applied uh, to, for visa to India and uh, thinking that I may be, uh, you know, there may be roadblocks and I may have to go away, come back to continue mm -hmm. the journey from where I left off. I applied for a two year visa, multiple entry. And then, surprise, it came back with a 10 year visa, multiple oh, entry. Wow. So without charging me any extra fees, they approved it. They, I had slipped in a project brief in there as well. I think they liked what they saw. And so they were gracious and supportive. So sometimes it works well. Sometimes it takes, it just takes the right person to see this and appreciate it and say, yeah, why don't we help this guy? Oh, that's so exciting. Congratulations. We're always crossing our fingers yeah. to find such people along the way. So um, bureaucracy can be, uh, sol can solve all problems because they know all the rules and they know how to navigate the uh, rules. And, uh, or they can be roadblocks. They can just throw their hands up and say, no, we're not going to do this. Um, so it can go either way. Yeah. So I just hope to fall on their yeah, <laughs> better well, side <laughs> all times. That's the start of something good. That's great. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we discussed last time um, we spoke that education is a significant part of everything you do. Um, the mission of your nonprofit around and over is to educate and inspire. Um, what are the goals for this particular adventure? Well, ever since I left California, uh, we have partnered with Ocean Recovery Alliance. And um, the primary drive in this crossing to until Philippines has been to highlight the plastic pollution mm -hmm. in the ocean and uh, highlight the impact of humanity on fellow creatures on this earth and trying to convey to people that, hey, we have become pests killing our host here. Can we please become stewards and save this earth for our grandchildren? If it's not for us, it's going to be for them. And so that's been my uh, what I've been agitating for. And uh, whenever I had the chance, I connected with classrooms. We partnered with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, uh, an outfit that's affiliated with National Geographic and have a, has a network of classrooms that can come in and we can do YouTube Live, Facebook Live, uh, all the social media tools that there's available to get into classrooms and then they can interact with adventurers like myself or scientists on uh, the South um, Antarctic, uh, McMurdo Station or, uh, you know, astronauts in the space station. The, the range is wide and so it's been an interesting collaboration with them. So uh, whenever I get a chance, of course, I get into classrooms in the countries and areas that I visit. All of these are uh, 
opportunities that I seek. And whenever I get the chance, I do connect with ch uh, school children. And uh, we have, through Around and Over, done fundraising for specific projects like building a classroom in Arusha, Tanzania, which uh -huh. this was for a middle school that served uh, the children of the porters that were helping us uh, to climb uh -huh. climb Anjara, for example. It was a thank you gesture. Um, I have also raised, uh, oh, close to about $100,000 for in support of boarding school students that are in primary and middle school age group uh, in rural Turkey. So where there are not enough staff or facilities or mm -hmm. the means to educate them in their own small settlements and villages, they go boarding into a central location where everything is provided and they get a better quality education but then if they have all sorts of needs they come without shoes sometimes uh you know it's it's an ongoing challenge and i was trying to do my part on that one too so oh that's you know you, you said something last time that really stuck with me and i think it's uh, you know um that you tell children um that they should not clip their own wings and yes. even ad adults do this. I love when you say that, that we tend to lower our standards. We go for low hanging fruit um, more than the bigger challenges. And yes. that may help us redefine who we are um, and reinvent ourselves. And it's funny, you also said leaving your comfort zone and facing challenges head, head on allows us to grow into the people who can get this stuff done. Um, certainly defines you. I would think, you know, for most of us, getting out of a comfort zone is spending, mm -hmm. you, you have spent over 300 days um, continuously on the sea or, I mean, I, I can't even imagine, I was going to ask how many miles did you can I go on, on the bicycle? Um, but it, it's truly inspiring and planting those seeds with the school children. To yes. think that, you know, look at this, you know, th th this man who clearly um, does this, yeah. I can do it too. Yes. Uh, I will uh, talk about this uh, clipping our wings uh, comment, uh, but going back to the previous question, I didn't yeah. quite answer your question. Yeah, uh, in the upcoming phase, my goal will be to continue our collaboration with Ocean Recovery Alliance and Plastic Issue mm -hmm. uh, across the South China Sea and still continue to connect with classrooms after I get on land and so forth. And the distance that I will bicycle, hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, will be about 12,000 miles from oh, wow. Vietnam to Portugal before I can relaunch from there towards South America. And as uh, uh, and uh, going back to clipping our wings, uh, one uh, lesson that I share, I think the biggest lesson that I have observed in my previous circumnavigation was that at the beginning I had my doubts. I was anxious. I didn't know if I was going to be able to finish it. Is this bigger than I can swallow? Did I bite something chew, uh, yeah. bigger than I can chew? Uh, is this going to work? Uh, we don't have enough sponsors. Are we going to be able to pay for all this? And I had all sorts of questions and doubts. A huge fog following me around. But by the time that I did finish it, I had become the person who had established 15 years world records and established historic firsts. So I had to grow into that person. So the person at the beginning didn't know, had its, his doubts. The person at the end looking back said, oh yeah, of course you could do it. You just had to become the person who could. And uh, going forward, I have my question marks again. Is this going to work? Uh, are these, am I, am I up to the task? Yes, I am. But is the world up to the task now? Yeah. Are we going to be able to make this happen? And will the world bend to my will, uh, <laughs> my desires? Uh, so that's the big question mark right now. Uh, since I have uh, more uh, distance to cover over land on this version of the circumnavigation, in the previous one, I had limited land uh, travel. I had Australia and then Africa, crossing Africa. This one is a huge overland leap mm -hmm. all the way to Portugal. And it 
makes me in face with all sorts of cultures, different languages, different customs, different bureaucratic rules, different pandemic is not making anything easy. So I'm going to, assuming Myanmar works out great, then I'm going to go through India and as crowded as it is, I think it's going to be just fine. Uh, last year in the summer, I will be going through there in June or so. They were boiling in 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It was just the climate change was not helping them at all. So that's going to be a task. And then I will go over to Pakistan and Karachi onward to Iranian border is uh, the south side of Baluchistan. Well, people walk around with AK-47s over there and <laughs> I will use the roads away from the Afghani border, way near the southern coast, but still there's going to be probably a requirement for escort, who knows. And then Iran is not uh, at peace at this point. There are uh, protests going on and heavy-handed reaction to those protests is common. Again, restrictions and escorts and trouble may be around the corner. Uh, then I will get to Azerbaijan, Georgia, into Turkey, onward into Europe. So each one of these are going to have their own specific requirements and challenges. And I'm just going to have to bend with it and see if I can figure out my path forward. And again, it'll be that the journey will provide. The people that I need will show up and... Uh, just vulnerability engenders kindness, I found out. Yes. So seeing me toiling away, breaking sweat, putting the sweat equity into this journey, people figure out a way to become part of the journey. It's not so. So uh, when I show up with a bicycle, they're not going to say, well, no, we're not going to let you in. They will probably say, okay, let me call my superior. We'll see what we can do. And that's, that's going to likely going to be the case and i'm going to park myself for two three days uh <laughs> by their door waiting for an answer yeah. and then carry on at worst i can be turned back and have to fly into the next country and then figure out that logistics mm -hmm. so those kinds of things are going to uh, be sorted on a daily basis day-to-day -day basis I'm excited to, to hear about it. And the, the changes, you know, you, you mentioned, I think Ocean Recovery Alliance is just an incredible organization. I you know yes. you're an ambassador and what they have done for decades. I mean, so ahead of the curve in addressing, um, you know, plastic pollution. And mm -hmm. it, it's incredible. And you, you've told us what you um you know, see actually at sea and on land. <laughs> so yes. it'll be interesting to even see, you know, broader as aspects of um, what you're going to be experiencing. Uh, yes. well, uh, you know, with climate change in general, it, we've talked on this, um, on our podcast series about climate displacement and whatever. It'll be interesting. I can't yeah. even imagine what you'll be, you know, experiencing. Yes, climate change is not anything that, uh, that we should dismiss. Uh, there's a tendency, depending on political affiliation, to believe it or not. And then based on our beliefs, not on evidence or data, argue onward for mm -hmm. or against. Uh, so that's the wrong way to approach this. I mean, Pentagon has come up with the strategic and the long-term implications of climate change and how it's going to cause people to lose their livelihood and be forced out of their uh, countries or territories mm -hmm. in, onto neighboring countries just to survive because they can no longer make it. And that mass migration is going to create instability, political instability is going to create conflict and wars and uh, all sorts of expenditures uh, and costs externalities that one has to deal with and so pentagon has known this for the longest time we need to stop arguing about this and do what's necessary it's a national security issue come on uh, so we can't be uh, fiddling our thumbs and we need to uh, as humanity put a collective front uh, against this and come up with solutions because uh as we are looking at the data, it's looking like the, the one and a half degrees or two degrees warming 
that was going to be the cap. But right now, as the data suggests, it's baked in. No matter how much we reduce our carbon uh, emissions or uh, greenhouse gases, that is baked in. It's going to happen. The question is, how far beyond that are we going to go? And business as usual is just not going to solve the problem. And uh, we need solutions. Uh, when you get some good news here and there, there is this promise of uh, the fusion reactor <laughs> progress on that, which is energy production without the emissions and yeah. without the radioactive waste that is typical, uh, or not as at, at the same severe severity. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, these things are possibilities. Technology may help us actually, but then again, uh, it does require a massive attitude adjustment, investment in public transportation, taking cars off the road, uh, going for bicycles and mass transportation and metro systems and all these things. It, it, and it's a huge adjustment issue. And we can't just say, well, I want my car and my freedom. Well, uh, we need to sacrifice our gardens and live in more concentrated cities so that metros works and i mean look at new york uh, and look at dc it's, they mm -hmm. get around just fine and and they uh, those are lively cities so these kinds of things are choices that we make every day and uh, it's another lesson that i share i think uh, so if you look at my choices at sea i choose to live on a 24 foot boat uh, the living area the deck is a fraction of that and i sacrifice creature comforts warm showers <laughs> cold drinks and yeah. food that i want company that i keep all of those are sacrificed and i put the sweat equity in it takes uh, a lot of uh, it causes fatigue and effort and all of those. And when we look at it, it's a pricey adventure. It's not just the cost, it's in, monet in monetary terms, but it requires sacrifices. And when I do accomplish these crossings, success is not accidental and it's being appreciated and records are registered and people pay attention. And here we are talking, you're talking to me because I have done all these adventures. Uh, I don't want to belittle what I have done. However, you wouldn't be talking to me unless I had done all these things. And the value that is gleaned out of this, the, the value that's observed is because of all the sacrifices attached to it and the sweat equity attached to it. So what I'm trying to get at is life is about choices. And as humanity, if we were to make these choices and instead of being a consumption driven society, be a society that is considered less driven by consumption and money and greed and scale back, we degrowth is really what we need to look at. We need to look at rewilding so that creatures on this earth have space to exist despite us and we need to learn to coexist and be stewards and as we scale our lifestyles back let's have everybody on board uh, if we could agree to have two children only <laughs> you know we were 2 billion 1.9 billion at 1900 and then we are now 8 billion and by 2050 we'll be 10 billion and we are already if everybody on earth consumed like a typical American, we would need, um, what's, what was it? I'm blanking out, four, uh, two and a half Earths or four and a half Earths. <laughs> so uh, it, the, uh, a fraction of Earth's population lives it with first world lifestyle. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we drive everywhere and we live in big houses and we buy our coffee and with a plastic cup on it and then we toss it after single use and we get our water in these little plastic bottles and then we drink it and throw it away. So all these single use plastic habits are first world issues. And then if everybody lived that same way, everybody required a car and consumed as 
uh, a typical American would, then uh, we would need four Earths, five Earths worth of uh, raw materials just to sustain that. And then we don't have that. It's just going to create more conflict, more friction, wars, people grabbing resources where any way they could. That's the source of conflicts anyway. And uh, so if we were to accept that and scale back, I think we would feel good about it and we would have a story to talk about and we would have uh, something to take pride in. We would say, hey, we have still this earth for our grandchildren. Look what we have achieved instead of turning over all our pollution to them to deal with. Um, so if there are awards and accomplishments and acknowledgements for the choices that I've done to scale back my needs at sea and then achieve that crossing, it's a similar thing. This, just like my vessel is my lifeline and my world on the ocean, mm -hmm. this earth, this piece of rock is the vessel that's carrying us hurtling through space for 8 billion creatures, humanity, and everybody along on it. This vessel is our spaceship. It needs to last the duration, and it needs to um, be available for the future generations. Uh, so for us to be able to say, we've done good, we've done well, and here it is, a pristine Earth. We turn it over to you better than we found it. You know, you go visit yeah, a, <laughs> you go visit a friend's home, stay there overnight, and then you try to clean up and you know the, the room, organize the room, strip the sheets, and do the laundry, and just help mm -hmm. in the process and leave it better than you found it. And that's how I try to operate in daily life. And why not consider that scale it up to the earth itself? And for our grandchildren, we have to do that. I just keep saying that we have to become stewards. No, you know, absolutely. And, you know, I, I invite everyone to follow you and hear more about you at the um, web addresses that are, are shown here. Um, you are an incredible steward and ambassador, not just for Ocean Recovery Alliance, but of, um, I think this vessel we call Earth, but it's such a pleasure. I so appreciate you taking the time um, to speak with us today, Ariden. Um, Our team was so excited to um, at the prospect of um, having regular updates on this journey of yours. So really excited about that. We'd love to keep everyone posted um, yes. as we follow well, you along this uh, biking and rowing the China Sea. And mm -hmm. uh, but really excited about that. I wish you, you know, incredible safe journeys and look forward to speaking. And thank you. Thank you again. We can't again. wait to track your journey. Glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Erdin. And thank everyone for joining us today. We're looking forward to following um, Erdin's journey and receiving updates. Thanks to all for tuning in. If you like the conversation, please give us a like and follow and subscribe to our channel. Hope to see you next time.